Hitler did not, for, just for nothing, kill his own people. Stalin did just that. He killed left and right in the 30s. Now, that is incomprehensible to me. There had to be a reason. He killed, he killed, and he killed. By the time of his 50th birthday in 1929, Stalin had gained control of the Soviet Union. As general secretary of the Communist Party, he had put his own men into office, squeezing out the opposition. Stalin now set about transforming the country into a modern world power, no matter what price in human life. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries, Stalin said. We must make good this distance in 10 years or go under. The massive industrialization program Stalin now launched required huge sacrifices. Most of the sacrifices would fall on the peasants. Stalin began by forcing them all into collective farms. His aim was to ensure the supply of food to the state by turning the countryside into one huge agricultural factory. I would say it was a more important, more irreversible turning point than the revolution of 1917 itself because it destroyed the Russian peasantry, destroyed as a class, as a way of life, the basic population of the country, still some 80% of the population with their traditional rural, private land, religious structure of life, swept away, because what was collectivization but a kind of coup d'etat against the Russian peasantry. Collectivization had a strong ideological motive. Forcing the peasants to work directly for the state would turn them, the party believed, into socialists. There was one category beyond socialist redemption, the kulaks, or rich exploiting peasants. They were blamed in Soviet propaganda newsreels for everything, from arson to murder. In fact, there had been no real kulak since the 1917 revolution. The state simply branded anyone as a kulak who was better off or who resisted collectivization. On the 27th of December, 1929, Stalin announced that the kulaks would be eliminated as a class. Ten million men, women and children were to be driven off the land. Some were simply shot. The party mobilized the young activists for the assault, forcing socialism into the countryside, whatever the cost. For those churning out the broadsheets, the socialist end justified the drastic means. Так же как расправу с крестьянами, мы думали, что вот крестьянам будет лучше теперь, что вот кулаков выселили. В колхозы людей загнали, и вот теперь они постепенно станут социалистом. Я сейчас понимаю, что это было, это было преступление у карьеристов, у холодных людей. Это было преступление двойное. У нас, у глупых или самообманутых, обманывающихся, или обманутых мальчишек, или полуграмотных идеалистов, это было преступление невольное, но тем не менее очень большое. Абдурахман Автоханов witnessed the effects of this crime during a stop on a train journey in the early 30s. Бесконечное поле с людьми, с женщинами, детьми, стариками и все общее вой. Их погружают в скотские вагоны и отправляют себе. Я одному человеку задал вопрос станционному смотрителю там, э, какому-то начальнику. Что это такое? Что случилось здесь? 
А ты что, с Луны свалился или из Персии прибыл сюда? Коллективизации и ликвидации кулакс как класс. But by eliminating the kulaks, the state was getting rid of its most successful farmers. The food supply crisis became acute. Forced into collective farms, many peasants first slaughtered their animals. There were severe grain shortages. Stalin turns to a class approach to this peasantry. He begins to feel himself in battle with them. He doesn't believe that there is no grain. He claims they hide. Stalin sent requisition squads out into the country. They were made up of party activists and members of the GPU, the Internal State Security Agency. They do find some grain, but this grain is the material to sow. It's the sowing grain, so they take away this too. This means famine. The most fertile parts of the Soviet Union were the hardest hit. The famine began in 1932, spreading across the Ukraine, the Kuban, and the areas of the Don and Volga rivers. A vast stretch of land with 40 million inhabitants. The requisition squads descended without mercy on villages and collective farms. It didn't matter that a family had given up all the food it had for its own survival. І ця комісія ходила у кожну хату, з хати в хату, і все забирала до, до зернинки, до квасулинки. І так же поступила і з нашою сім'єю. О, і все зачистили до, до останньої зернини, і ми і залишили нашу сім'ю на явну голодну смерть. Аліса Масло і її п'ятирічний брат були сені до орфанажу, як цей один. He died there of hunger. Meanwhile, her mother and older brother lay sick from famine at home. Every village had its cart to haul away the dead. Elisa arrived home one day to find her older brother dead as well, and the cart outside. Заходить у хату, стягнув цього старшого брата з печі, витягнув на віз, положив, а тоді заразом і живу маму. Я стала плакати, він говорить, а ти йди у Майдан, там тобі дадуть похльобуки, а вона все одно помре. Я за нею другий раз їхати не буду. О, і, так ми, і так я за, за, пішла, плачучи на цей, на цей колгоспу, цей Майдан, і залишилася круглою сиротою, без ні, нікого. News of the famine and the mounting death toll reached Stalin from a number of different sources, including the GPU. But Stalin paid no heed. He just kept piling on the pressure. By now, it functions in a way where information that has to reach Stalin is the one that he wants to have. And he has the means to get just that. It's true, 1932, 33, there's much more than that still. A year or so later, nothing will reach him that he doesn't want at all. But the power is already concentrated to such extent that he has the means to say reality is what I say it is. Reality for the peasants pushed some over the edge. Ivan was a specialist, Stoller was a good guy. He was a good guy, 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 a good guy. He was a good guy, a good guy, a good guy. He came to such a degree, as they say, Ну, до, до безсознання, от. а їсти хоче, так він зарізав свою дитину і став їсти м'ясо, дитини своєї. Ну, жінка перелякалась, побігла в сільраду, от. заявила, що чоловік з дурімо зарізав дитину. То забрали і невідомо, де його діли. От. Де він дівш, ніхто не знає. No authentic newsreel film has yet come to light of the famine the state wanted kept secret. There was no hope of aid from abroad. Malcolm Mugridge, almost alone among Western journalists, visited the Ukraine, reported what he saw, and left immediately. Other reporters were too worried about being thrown out of the country to cover the famine. Many Westerners, like George Bernard Shaw, visited in the early 30s and saw no hunger. Shaw was mightily impressed. 
the Soviet Union was, he felt, a great social experiment. By 1933, millions were dead. There is now no doubt that the famine was man-made by Stalin. Uh, Stalin w was indeed responsible for the famine in that um, while uh, the peasants were going hungry in 1932 and 1933 and famine was stalking the countryside, not the towns, he insisted on continuing the huge scale of grain exports abroad in return for which machinery was purchased to be brought in for industrialization. And this could have been reduced in some of the grain used to, to feed the hungry people, but Stalin was not about to do that. Stalin was, I think, angered beyond measure by, and frustrated by the refusal of the peasants, even under conditions of terror, to respond to the collectivization campaign. And this was his vengeance against them. The price of Stalin's vengeance was between five and seven million dead from the famine. In this one small Ukrainian village, over 360 men, women and children died. Still remembered, still mourned. The peasants could not easily turn to their church. Orthodox faith, central to peasant life for a thousand years, was trampled underfoot when there was most need of its guidance and comfort. Stalin had trained as a priest in his youth. He now presided over the virtual destruction of religion. The Soviet state was officially atheist. Lenin had declared that every idea of God is unutterable vileness. Priests were rounded up. Churches turned into grain stores or rubble. The Soviet state had no use for old theology. It had its own. Industrialization was the new faith. Factories were its cathedrals. Its priests were the elite workers who smashed production targets and led the way to the future. Not all who built cities like Magnitogorsk were superheroes. Many were peasants exiled as kulaks. Unskilled and untrained, they faced severe problems in adapting to industrial processes. These problems were interpreted by the state as sabotage. Я ни разу не видел, чтобы кто-нибудь из рабочих, из инженеров занимался вредительством. Я видел людей, не умеющих работать и в силу этого допускающих ошибки, промахи, поломку машины. Stalin used show trials designed to publicize the threat of wreckers. Engineers and managers were rounded up and accused of fictitious conspiracies. Instead of relaxing tempos, Stalin increased them. Production lines were halted not by traitors, but by a lack of the right parts, often matched by too many of the wrong kind. The first tractor proudly wheeled out of the Stalingrad tractor factory was a dummy. So delayed and mismanaged was the production schedule. Managers who pleaded for more realistic planning were accused of wrecking. Initiative was paralyzed. Skilled people were shot or sent to the camps. There had been prison camps in Lenin's time, but under Stalin, the camp network, known as the Gulag, grew. By 1931, the Gulag held nearly two million men and women.
Forced labor by innocent people was now a key part of the economy. The demand for labor led to arrest quotas. Many people found themselves in the gulag simply because Stalin needed their labor to build whatever he wanted, wherever he wanted it. He had a fascination for grandiose projects, like this one, the Bellamore Canal. Stalin took the map of the Soviet Union, drawing onto it himself the route of this strategic waterway. 270 kilometers long, it was designed to give Stalin's navy access between the Baltic and White Seas. Construction involved joining up the lakes of Soviet Karelia with a series of canals. Variations in water levels were handled by 19 locks. Building the Bellamore Canal involved a quarter of a million prisoners. Peasants, priests, criminals, academics, men and women. Innocence counted for nothing. To keep costs down, the GPU spent no hard currency abroad on heavy equipment. It was all built by hand. Pile drivers were powered not by steam, but by people, forced into giant human treadmills. Это металлические тросы, и причем многие тросы, вернее все они почти были старые, колючие, эти, они же проволочные, из тонкой проволоки, все были изранены, кровь течет, все, все эти люди падали, травм много, не, не приспособлены ничего, и все это люди не умели. Вот. Ну и конечно, это была невероятно тяжелая работа, каторжная. The guard shot anyone who tried to escape. Food was rationed according to work output, ensuring the death of the weak and ill. The terrible cold and sheer exhaustion killed the most. Burial was rudimentary. Bodies were simply tossed into ditches. Уже к весне, когда уже таять стало, то руки, ноги и головы, прямо это же близко, все-таки 150 метров, во все это просматривается, это торчат торчат из, из под снега, из зимы, и из этого из земли, и уже вранье там летает над ними, же, еще они, можно сказать, были заморожены, свежие, и их там клюют. Opening day, August 1933. The prisoners anxiously awaited their release as promised. But tens of thousands were not freed, kept on to maintain the canal, or else transferred to other forced labor projects. Stalin came to open the canal himself. He is said to have been disappointed with his brainchild. It turned out to be too shallow and too narrow. It froze solid half the year and was bombed by the Germans early in the war. Over 60,000 men and women lost their lives building it. Stalin's policies and despotic methods were now being called into question. Some dared discuss his removal from office. There were criticisms of Stalin's policies close to home. From his second wife, Nadezhda Aliluyeva. She was 22 years younger than Stalin and studying textile production. They did not get on well, and Nadezhda was highly strung. One night in November 1932, after a public row with Stalin, she shot herself dead. My aunt told me later <clears throat> that she left a letter, which she obviously wrote that night. Uh, very accusative uh, letter to father, uh, accusative in a way that could make him think that she was very much against his policies at the time, uh, and not only so that she would be uh, sympathizing with opposition, with people who were against collectivization and against these things. Stalin's response was one of bitter resentment. He went up to her coffin at the funeral and made as if to push it away, saying, she left me as an enemy. It is always said Stalin never visited her grave, but his bodyguard remembers differently. And when they were buried, Stalin went to the 
Вот посидит туда, это уже нам пришло, приходилось его сопровождать туда. Посидит там час, полтора, так покурит там, посидит, так, и возвращался. Таким образом, он ночью ездил несколько раз туда. One man in the Politburo seemed a possible rival to Stalin. His close friend, Sergei Kirov, the popular Leningrad party boss. My data, which means reading his speeches, and very numerous speeches, show a man who clearly regrets the whole policy uh, of, the, of the forced collectivization and many other aspects. And he says so very often, we didn't know anything about agriculture. So this is part of his uh, speeches. We should have been listening to the old peasants. We never did this. We forced them to throw uh, grain into dirt, which is clear that it's a revision of the previous policy, which is Stalin's policy. In 1934, delegates gathered for the 17th Communist Party Congress in Moscow. There would be a crucial vote for re-election to the party's Central Committee. Some delegates saw this as a chance to replace Stalin with Kirov. A group of Leningrad party members had met privately to plan this strategy at the flat of Nikolai and Natalia Rodionov. Перебирали, какая, какие делегации, сколько голосов, сколько всего будет делегатов, и какой процент голосов будет безусловно за Сергея Мироновича. Ну там вспоминали Ивана Вознесенскую область, за Кавказье, ну Ленинградская само собой. Потом э, Казахстан и э, Астрахань. Но остальные я не помню еще. Они подсчитывали, сколько в каждой делегации примерно лиц, и будет, сколько будет говорить за, за Кирова. Против Сталина я ничего не слышала, ничего не говорилось. Просто, значит, они хотели, чтобы был Киров первым секретарем. Kirov was also secretly approached by senior party figures and asked if he would accept the post of general secretary. Было тайное совещание, на котором Кирову предлагали стать на место Сталина генсеком. Конечно, после этого Сталин, когда узнал, он решил его устранить. И Киров это сознавал. Когда он вернулся в 17 съезде, он своим друзьям и родным говорил, что моя голова теперь на плахе. Kirov refused the offer. It was at the voting in the Congress for membership of the Central Committee that Stalin got the true picture of his popularity in the party. When the ballot boxes were opened, only three votes were cast against Kirov. But 292 people voted against Stalin. Stalin's loyal henchman, Lazar Kaganovich, was taken aside and told about the problem. Kaganovich made the necessary arrangement to ensure Stalin received the same number of votes as Kirov. Мы вскрыли с разрешения Политбюро пакеты с бюллетенями и установили, что не хватает 289 бюллетеней. А ведь когда докладывали на съезде, сказали, что три. Значит, три и 289, значит, он получил 292 против. А сейчас фальсифицируют, что неизвестно, он, может быть, только три получил. Потому что уничтожили документы, бюллетени сожгли. Коммунистическая партия Хедквартер, Ленинград, 10 months later. On the 1st of December 1934, Kirov was working in his office. A 30-year-old misfit named Nikolaev entered the building and went up to the second floor. Kirov's office was near the end of the corridor. Они вышли здесь кабинет, как раз муж стоял и разговаривал с этой скати. И в это время раздался выстрел. Они выскочили в коридор и увидели, что Сергей Миронович падает, как раз против дверей. Но это может быть метров в пяти от дверей моего мужа. Kirov's colleagues were quick to grab hold of Nikolaev. И вот Николаев в это время это рассказывали уже мужу, что он кричал, что а ведь мне же обещали, мне же обещали. Kirov was accorded a full state funeral. The outpourings of grief were a genuine mark of his popularity.
Stalin's response to the news of Kirov's murder was a decree ordering the immediate death penalty for acts of terror with no possible reprieve. It was clear that Nikolaev had not acted alone. But whose orders was he following? Olga Shatanovskaya was appointed to Khrushchev's commission of inquiry into Kirov's death. Khrushchev declared the conclusion too explosive to publish. She reveals it here for the first time. The operation was run from the Leningrad headquarters of the secret police, by 1934 renamed the NKVD. In overall command was Genrich Jagoda, Stalin's head of the NKVD. Nikolaev bore a grudge against Kirov, which they exploited. He was given extensive training, including target practice. The commission discovered that Kirov's bodyguard had been detained by NKVD men outside party headquarters to give Nikolaev a clear field upstairs. The commission spoke to hundreds of witnesses, unraveling the vote rigging at the 17th Party Congress and the secret offer of the general secretaryship to Kirov, who then knew his days were numbered. Olga Shatanovskaya is adamant. Stalin quickly covered his tracks. Nikolaev was shot. Kirov's bodyguard was clubbed to death. Mass arrests followed, generally at night. In time, most of the nearly 2,000 delegates to the 17th Party Congress were wiped out, and their memories with them. By 1935, 100,000 people had been arrested in Leningrad alone. Innocent people sent to the camps or shot. Uh, here is where you begin this, uh, what some people call high Stalinism. Terror for terror. There's no reason why them could have been somebody else. He is by now in a state of delusions of some sort, in which his enemies are imprecise, they are almost everywhere. So whomever you arrest oh, is, is an enemy, or whoever you didn't yet arrest might have been, begins this deeply pathological period of Stalinism that has still a way to go and to grow into monstrous forms, but that's what it is. In this frame of mind, Stalin turned upon old defeated rivals, starting with Zinoviev and Kamyanev, party veterans from the earliest days of Lenin. Show trials became Stalin's device for proving that the Soviet Union was surrounded by enemies and infiltrated by spies. This then justified further repressions. Zinoviev and Kamyanev appeared in a show trial like this one, accused of murdering Kirov and conspiring with Stalin's arch enemy, Leon Trotsky, exiled abroad. They were shot in 1936. The export of communism abroad had been Trotsky's idea. In the early 30s, the Comintern, the international party organization, had tried to foster revolution in countries like Germany. But Stalin was suspicious of foreigners and of all contact with them. Rather than supporting the Comintern, he undermined it. Loyal Comintern agents were now rounded up. Я была, даже был момент, когда я думала, и я долго придерживалась этого мнения, что они меня арестовали перед тем, как послать меня на такую серьезную подпольную работу, как коммунистку, чтобы проверить, э, как я себя буду вести, если я окажусь в очень сложных the Soviet Union turned in on itself, looking no further than its great leader for inspiration. Soviet propaganda made Stalin into a living god, infallible and all-knowing, revered and loved. Нельзя было простому смертному выдержать такого натиска со стороны самого Сталина, со стороны сталинского режима со стороны сталинского аппарата давление на психику на разум на сердце на душу человека день и ночь радио 
нас убеждал Сталин величайший человек, благодетель человечества, отец народу, гений всех времен и народу. The country proclaimed itself unanimous behind Stalin. Stalin's taste prevailed in every aspect of Soviet life, particularly the arts. Painters, poets, novelists, composers were forced to conform. Those who could not fell silent or were sent to the camps. And yet there were positive achievements in the 30s. Giant projects like the Moscow Metro exemplified Soviet technology. The urban population doubled, becoming literate, better educated and upwardly mobile. For many, the sacrifices were justified in the name of progress, their countries and their own. American documentary film from the mid-30s shows this other side of Soviet life. While some were caught up in the terror, others worked, played, fell in love. In 1936, Stalin introduced a new Soviet constitution. It seemed to offer hopes of more civic rights, more democracy. But in fact, the voters had no choice. Behind the facade, Stalin's grip upon the country was tightening. The truth was, the system wasn't working. By 1936, grain production was at pre-First World War levels and falling. Industrial targets were being revised upwards, but investment cut. The response was to send in more party officials to farm and factory. But this only made matters worse. As it grew, the bureaucracy was stifling the centralized system which spawned it. Red tape, endless paperwork, doing things by the book, all ensured no one took any initiative. People were loyal to the boss and to their own position and privileges. Getting things done came last. But это еще к тому же имело внутреннюю закономерность разложения. Чем больше строят, тем труднее управлять сверху, потому что контроль снизу по существу отсутствует. Ответственности верха перед низом нет. Ответственность есть только снизу вверх перед начальством. Понимаете? И чем пирамидальнее, чем больше шире эта пирамида, тем хуже она работает. Stalin had an explanation for these failures in the system he himself had created. He was convinced that enemies of the working class were to blame. The Soviet state had tried to get rid of all other social classes, but some elements clung on. The fight against them, he said, had to be intensified because they would fight to the death, but not in open fight. They would strike anywhere at any time. The country had to be on its guard day and night. Anyone might be an enemy of the people. Stalin turned to the secret police, the NKVD. Run from the Lubyanka in Moscow, totally loyal, utterly ruthless. An empire in itself, not just prison camp guards and torturers, but people who mended the vehicles, who typed the orders for barbed wire. All part of the system. Yagoda, organizer of Kirov's murder, was out of office and doomed. But Stalin could rely on the new boss, Nikolai Yezhov, to do his bidding. Of course there will be victims in this fight, Yezhov told his men. When you cut down the forest, wood chips fly. You have to remember that this was not repression. This was terror. And that the red crimson of arrests and terror and bloodletting and fear and denunciation guilt by association, arrest by association, had spread almost everywhere in society. Nobody was safe. Nobody was guilty, so nobody was safe. Everybody was innocent, therefore everybody was vulnerable. The ground was prepared. The highly restrictive Tsarist system of internal passports had been reintroduced. The state could now monitor and control all movements inside the country. New repressive laws had been passed, making almost anything imaginable an offense against the Soviet state. Punishment, including execution, was now extended down to 12-year-olds. But if enemies of the people could be anywhere, how to find them? 
Инф... Моя мать рассказывала мне, что единственным показанием, по которому ее арестовали и дали срок 8 лет по обвинению в контрреволюционной деятельности, было, были показания Астрова. Она пришла со слезами, она не знала прежде об этом, она пришла со слезами и, и говорила, что какой ужас, как он мог. Как он мог, он же знал, что этого не было. The man who denounced Eichenwald's mother was Valentin Astrov. Ну, анализируйте все эти причины, но факт остается фактом. Народу-то я не изменял ведь тому, когда это делал, потому что весь народ так думал. А по существу, конечно, изменял, получается. Сейчас я вижу, и это мучительно очень. Astrov agreed to turn informer after a spell in prison and the removal of his party card. Позором сотрудничать с советскими социалистическими органами безопасности я не считал никогда и не считаю и раньше не считал когда не, не, не писал не давал этого обязательства не, не во время когда я выдавал и когда сейчас это для меня была единственная ниточка которая меня связывала с моей партией the NKVD vans were known as the Black Ravens. They generally went out at night. Часа в два ночи, 21 ноября, раздался стук ко мне в комнату. Мы жили в общей квартире. Дома был мой муж и моя сестра, которая тогда со мной жила. Дверь открыла без ключ от нашей квартиры. Был у нашей дворничихи, которая занималась уборкой квартиры. И она без звонка открыла дверь и подвела прямо к нашей комнате, что было довольно жестоко с ее стороны. И пришли два человека и делали тщательно, но мы спали. Они меня арестовали и привезли меня на Лубянку. Stalin legalized torture as both justifiable and appropriate. The NKVD used beatings, water torture, electric shock. The most effective, though, was the simplest. Ну а самое обычное это не давать спать во время этого конвейера совершенно круглыми сутками. Я сам это прошел на Лубянке, просто не давали спать. Ты только утром собираешься встать, только собираешься собираешься вечером поздно лечь спать как тебя вызывают на допрос, и когда ты утром после ночного допроса приходишь, хочешь отдохнуть, подъем, тебя поднимают. И вот так сутки, вторые, третьи, по 10, по 15 дней человек не выдерживает. Тебя могли не бить, а просто бессонницей мучить. Vans from the Lubyanka brought the bodies of the dead down this road, five miles from the center of Moscow. They stopped here. In the late 30s, it was open ground. И однажды мы, значит, бежали сюда играть. Вот с этого бугорка. Вот, видим, машина стоит. Машина стоит. И разгружают, в общем, людей. Совершенно голых. Люди стояли, значит, человека три их было. Были на них одеты перчатки резиновые, халаты темные и фартуки резиновые. Вот они, значит, их и выкидывали. У них в руках были крючки, они и крючками их выкидывали. For those who survived interrogation, the next destination, and for millions the final destination, was the Gulag. filled up with party members, the military, artists, scientists, bureaucrats, even the NKVD itself. Понятно, что выжить, я уже говорил, что этапы приходят целыми поездами, и через 2-3 недели они плашмя лежат. 
лошадка лежат, да, опух, опухают и это, мочатся под себя, и уже встать не могут, и прибавят и целиком. Survival exacted a terrible toll, as Olga Schlausberg realized when she finally got to a bathhouse with a mirror. Я кричу, зеркало, зеркало, а мы побежали все, мы четыре года себя не видели. Ну и все без платья, все голые, и бежим к этому зеркалу. Подбежали, целая толпа, и я не вижу, где я, я не могу себя найти. Я же была молодая, я помнила себя молодой. И вдруг я увидела глаза моей мамы и седую голову с прощей сильной. И я поняла, что это я. The camp spread across the land in clusters. The gold mining camps in the far east with a special camp for torture and execution. Egarka in Siberia, with its lumber and port construction. Railway building in Pechora, coal mining in Forkuta. Bitterly cruel regimes in the harshest climates. The punishment of millions of innocent people. Many thought that Stalin knew nothing of the terror. If only he could be told, they said, he'd soon put a stop to it. перед народом. Перед рабочим классом. Перед крестьянством. Перед интеллигенцией. But Stalin knew all about the terror. Я собственными глазами видел десятки, сотни документов, на которых стоит роспись Сталина, утверждение огромного количества списков к смертной казни. Наиболее потрясающие я такой документ, группа документов нашел. Когда 12 декабря 1938 года Сталин и Молотов подписали около 30 списков, но общей, чьей общей численностью 3182 человека. 3182 человека к смертной казни в течение одного дня. И после этого, как я подсчитал, мне многие дни известны по часам даже, чем Сталин занимался, он пошел с Молотовым смотреть свой очередной ночной фильм. Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, once interceded to save the life of a school friend's father. She was told never to do it again. How does she feel about her father and the terror now? Well, he was the leader of the party uh, which performed all that. First of all, it's the fact which we all know can't get away with it. He was not alone, there was the whole Politburo which supported him and went with these policies. You, you cannot change history. I am not here to tell you to change history or to make it looking more pleasant or more agreeable or to uh, take out from there what I wish would never be there. I wish I, wish I could tell you that um, yeah, my father didn't have anything to do. Uh, with it, but I, I can't. By the late 30s, Stalin was increasingly capricious. He could be open, charming even, but his moods were ever more dark and suspicious. Alexander Avdienko, now a writer, was hauled before his hero for a film script Stalin didn't like. Stalin, а я его видел в метре от себя. Он все время ходил вокруг, мимо меня. Он все время обращался ко мне, тыкал в меня трубкой и пальцем. 
не сводил с меня глаз, гневных, желтый глаз, нечеловеческий глаз хищника, и очень громко разговаривал, кричал. У него была пена на кубах. Он гневался, как бог Саваов. Он был абсолютно не похож на того Сталина, которого я привык видеть. There were still old enemies. The remnants of the leadership under Lenin were subjected to the biggest show trial of all, as Stalin tried to obliterate the parts of Soviet history he didn't like, in which he hadn't been the hero. The main accused were Lenin's old colleagues, ex-Prime Minister Alexei Rykov and Nikolai Bukharin. Bukharin had been the party theoretician, educated and popular. He and Stalin had ruled the Soviet Union together in the 1920s. Stalin had pushed him out of office and now wanted him dead. First, Bukharin had to be denounced by Valentin Astrov. Ему, что надо признать такой смысл, под текст этого был, что надо признать это, вот, что мы обязаны это сделать, раз партия этого хочет. Но смысл именно тот, что это ради, ради социалистической родины, ради партии это сделано. The trial was a sham. The witnesses were bogus and their evidence false. Bukharin confessed to a general conspiracy charge, but turned the tables on the court by denying the detail of the accusation. His final speech expressed his complete loyalty to the party. Yet the motive behind his confession was perhaps less duty to party unity than fears for the safety of his wife and young child. Ну, не знаю. Может быть, Николай Иванович заработал мне жизнь все-таки. Не знаю. Так что очень многие, множество сил действовало, потом пытки. И, несомненно, было колоссальное количество показаний против Бухарина, против Рыкова, потому что в первую очередь нужно было их убить. И они достигались ужасающими пытками. Это уже теперь доказано. Что касается Николая Ивановича, я слышала, что его физически не пытали, но насколько это верно, я не знаю. Ну так может пытали Рыкова. Если Рыков уже дал показания, это, это, это было страшным ударом. Я не знаю, кто первый дал показания. Это трудно сказать. Но так или иначе, одно то, что они могли показывать друг против друга, уже говорит о том, какие методы к ним применялись. Stalin's chief prosecutor, Vyshinsky, summed up the spirit of the times. Bukharin, Rykov, and most of the others were shot. Bukharin's wife, Anna, spent over 20 years in the camps and Siberian exile. She did not see her baby son for 19 years. Trotsky in exile in Mexico was top of Stalin's hit list. Trotsky had been the leading figure alongside Lenin in both the revolution and civil war, a place in history Stalin bitterly envied. Trotsky tried to convince a world largely seduced by Stalin's propaganda that Stalin was in fact a dangerous despot. Stalin's trial against me is built upon false confessions extorted by modern inquisitorial method in the interest of the ruling clique. There are no crime in history more terrible in intention or execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev and Radek Petakov. These trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from, from Stalinism. That is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people. Trotsky's house in Mexico City was heavily fortified against attack. 
But in May 1940, he and his family narrowly escaped death when NKVD gunmen sprayed the bedroom with bullets. An NKVD assassin then infiltrated Trotsky's circle under the name Jackson. On the 20th of August, he went into Trotsky's study and plunged an ice pick into his head. Jackson spent 20 years in prison, but was rewarded by Stalin with the order of hero of the Soviet Union. The decade had begun with terror in the countryside, forced collectivization, the elimination of the so-called kulaks, the man-made famine. Even though Stalin turned on the party and the intelligentsia after the murder of Kirov, he kept up the pressure on the countryside throughout the 30s. Основная масса лагерников это были крестьяне и рабочие. Вот. Главным образом крестьяне. И они, скорее всего, как ни странно, погибали. Погибали от холода и голода, потому что они работали изо всех сил. И они поэтому скорее погибали. А массовые эти могилы разбросаны по всей нашей земле. Kuropati Forest, just outside Minsk, capital of the Soviet Republic of Bielorussia. Between 1937 and 1941, innocent, ordinary men and women were driven here in vans by the NKVD day and night. Ой, сколько ж я чула, это ж близко к Алинацку. А я же ночью последние годы уже я дежурила. Так и бачила, и чула все на свете. Як плакали, як кричали, як привязывать уже стрелять. А ночь тихо, уже машины тише ходят, и все. Так и днем стреляли. И днем стреляли, было у них такое... Pits had been dug in the forest. Two people at a time were brought to the edge by uniformed NKVD men, shot from behind and pushed in, layer after layer, until the pit was full. Коли у зимовой могиле люди одетые были, ну зимовую вопротку они занимали больше места. Там человек 150 умещалось, а у летних могилах до 260 человек. У всех же могил у Куропатах, я уже сказал, больше тысячи. При этом есть могилы э, до уже не до 10 метров. Вот у таких могилах тысячи человек расстреляны и похованы. At least 100,000 men and women were killed in Kuropati forest. Zenon Posniak believes the total may be as high as a quarter of a million, and they are finding other forests like Kuropati. No one will know how many died under Stalin in the 30s until Soviet archives are opened. Maybe not even then. Estimates range from 8 to 14 million people killed. Even children were in the camps. <laughs> По территории Карлага, возле колючей проволоки. Мы боялись выйти за эту зону. Мы ее так и называли за зоной. Потому что за зоной опасность. А в зоне, видать, ее не было. Сидели охранники наверху. Они нас наверняка охраняли. Это было счастье. И вроде бы и думать не надо. Маму-то мы знали по тюрьме, а папа и не задумывались. Есть ли папа? Сталин папа. The country was caught in a nightmare. Children were locked up, but so too was the wife of Kalinin, president of the Soviet Union. Some of Stalin's own relatives were arrested and shot. With war looming in Europe, Stalin executed 50,000 senior military officers, including three of the five Soviet marshals. The NKVD kept filling up the pits in Kuropati forest with dead bodies, until the summer of 1941, when German troops came over the brow of the hill. <laughs> <laughs> 